All right. Hey, Autumn, I see that Eric is here as an attendee. You want him promoted to a panelist so he can participate? Sure. Thank you. All right. Uh, we may have a few more people joining us, but um, Jessica, I think we can get going. Um, uh, real quick, before we um, jump into the agenda, I did want to make sure that everybody received the minutes from our first meeting. Um, they were sent out um, a little bit ago, and then also with the agenda, I wanted to see if anyone had any adjustments or revisions, or if everyone's good to go with those, and we'll get them posted. All right. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so we'll be pretty informal, even though we're on Zoom. Zoom, uh, Zoom meetings are a little annoying. So, um, <laughs> uh, but raise your hand um, just because it's if everyone is talking at once. No, I have no idea who's actually saying anything. Um, and uh, Jessica will lead us through the agenda, but um, obviously participation is um, is important. So um, please, you know, just raise your hand so that we can acknowledge that you. Um, have something to share and uh, um, and we'll call on you um, and try to be informally formal, I guess, for this, for this one. <laughs> hey, Jamie, do you want to go ahead and take, do we want to take a roll just for the record? Um, yeah. <laughs> yes, sure. I will say Thanks. everyone's name who I see on my screen. And if you can just say here, that would be fantastic. <laughs> Well, because we're missing a few people. We are. And yeah, Autumn, are. you've got a... I got a... I got a... <laughs> For whatever reason. For also, whatever I want to um, welcome... Wanna, uh, welcome. Why is there an echo? Why is there an echo? <laughs> I don't want to have to listen to myself. Um, I want to welcome Noah Nigren from um, the Shellfish Commission. Noah, is it Shellfish or is it Coastal Waters? It's shellfish. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Um, so Noah is um, replacing Darren Granada, who was recently um, hired as the town's harbor master. Um, so uh, Noah is the new representative from um, Shellfish Commission. Um, we'll also need a representative from Coastal Harbors. Um, our representative from the uh, is it Community Services Advisory Board, Todd, um, yes. has has had to step down. Um, so we'll need a, a representative from, from that group as well. Um, and I'm trying to think if we have any other vacancies. I don't think that we do at this time. Um, and a new face on the screen from last meeting, also Todd Souza, our community services director, is also joining us on the committee. So um, yeah, I'll go ahead and do a roll call um, of the committee members. Um, so I'll just kind of go in order by who I see on my screen. Uh, Noah. Uh, Noah. You can just say here. Can say here. Sorry, was on mute here. Thank you, Thank Andrew. You. Andrew. Here, here. Thank you. Thank you. Robin. Robin. Here, here. Mike. Mike. Here. Maggie. Maggie. Here. here. Karen. Karen. Here. Thank or other you. Karen. <laughs> Both Karens. And I think everyone else is staff or consulting. So I'm not going to do a roll call for y'all, just our committee members. It's a big group and we're missing some. All right. Um, Jessica, if you want to jump into the agenda, unless there, unless we have any other kind of housekeeping stuff to... To do i think we're good to go okay um can you see my screen as like a full screen okay because yes. i have three screens in front of me and it's not like always clear which one i'm sharing but if you can see the full full page of what looks like a title slide then we're good to go 
Um, so welcome. Thanks for um, touching base here digitally in June as we get ready for our, our um, big session of public engagement in July. Uh, and let's see here. There we go. Um, there's the agenda. The um, the reason for meeting today, why we wanted to touch base quickly uh, digitally, um, was just to make sure we were all on board for what was happening for the public engagement in June, uh, or excuse me, July. So um, we'll start off with an existing conditions update, just letting you know what we're going to be doing or what we have been doing to update the data based on the feedback we received from you in May. And then the next three um, agenda points, um, public workshop, events-based public engagement activities, and digital public engagement, we'll just be going over the way that we're going to be um, sort of public facing this project to the um, to get the community involved. And then um, the last slide is um, an outline of where we expect the plan to go. Um, and so I wanted to put that out there now to get you um, thinking about it um, and maybe get some feedback um, and also just to contextualize how this is all going to land in a final plan. So just some quick updates on what we've been doing since our kickoff meeting in May. You guys gave us great feedback. Um, the land trust um, left us with an excellent map. Um, and so we've been making all of the updates um, that we've been able to, along with the town, um, to make sure that all of our existing data is as accurate as possible. I expect that this will continue to be done over the next couple of months. So where we are now or where we even are before the public meeting isn't going to necessarily be final final. Um, I expect we will get feedback from the public at the meeting in July that may actually further inform our existing conditions based data. But um, based on your feedback, um, we have been making updates to um, the private land um, by uh, identifying all of the ownership that we didn't know for all of the private land um, and just making updates based on what we learned from you. The municipal land, we've been reviewing um, all of that to determine what is in protection and, and what's not. Um, so the municipal land ultimately will have four categories and that includes civic land, um, such as where the town hall is located, developed civic land, recreation areas, that would be like parks and soccer, those places that are already in conservation that are owned by the town, and then undeveloped areas that are, I guess, technically open space, but they're not in conservation. So I know we had a lot of discussion about the categorization of the municipal land um, at our last meeting. So along with the town, um, we're working on trying to refine um, all of the parcel data into those categories. And then we're also um, making updates to the um, designated open space, which is the land that's included as open space in subdivisions, um, making sure that that's all accurately documented. And that's based on work that the town has been doing, um, uh, Emerson, uh, Autumns, and, J and uh, Jamie's team. Any questions about um, these updates or inquiries before I go on to the next slide? Oh, okay straightforward. Uh, so just to kind of refresh your memory here, um, I'll talk about the updates that we've been um, to the, the base data in a moment, but I wanted to refresh your memory and how we're using the data that I'll be talking about on the next slide. Um, and that is to use the existing data divided out by resource categories. That's the kind of the working title that we've been using. Um, our, we have six resource categories. We had five at our last meeting and we've added a new one. So we have habitat, agriculture and forestry, recreation and connectivity, sea level rise and marsh migration, uh, water quality, and then we have environmental hazards, which is the new one based on your feedback that we received in um, May. And so we are going to be using um, these six categories uh, to put to the public uh, and the committee to determine um, how this the data that exists within each of these six categories can be used to identify areas in the town as high medium and low prioritization areas so i just kind of wanted to refresh your memory on the process that we are going to be using to develop this prioritization map Jump in anytime if anybody has any questions. 
Um, and I um, have put on this slide, and Madeline, feel free to jump in here if I miss anything. Um, just talk over me. Um, so we have these six resource categories and we've been working to refine them and making sure that we have the best data going into this prioritization mapping. Um, so beginning with Habitat, we have a consultant on the team from FB Environmental. Um, she's an environmental specialist. Uh, and so we have been working with her um, to have her make sure that we have the best data um, and that the, um, the data is kind of ranked um, as a, based on environmental priorities of the habitats that may be the highest priority habitats to those lesser um, uh, priority habitat areas. So we have a, um, a consultant helping us with that first category. Um, going down to sea level rise and marsh migration, last week, very um, timely, the state released new data on um, marsh migration uh, data, and uh, that aligns with the um, sea level rise intervals that we would be using. So um, it's very well timed for us to um, include that data as part of our, this work. I have, I'm seeing things in the chat. Am I supposed to be following that, Jamie? Sorry. No, we just have a okay. question if, if the uh, the slides would be available after oh, the meeting. Oh, certainly. Yes, yes. Okay. You just tell me because I'm not able to talk and follow my slides and then watch the chat. So you just <laughs> bug, interrupt me at any point, anybody. Yeah, if there's anything you need to know, I'll let you know. Otherwise, you can okay. ignore the chat. Love it. Love it. <laughs> um, so moving down to recreation and connectivity, we are um, creating buffers around some of those recreational elements to, um, to identify areas of potential connectivity. So if there's a trail network, on um, in one parcel and a trail network in another parcel, um, we're working to create buffers to kind of show other areas within the in the in betweens that may show up as potential areas of connectivity. And we expect that this um, resource category will glean a lot from the public engagement as we get the public involved identifying places of potential connectivity. So that's kind of a, um, uh, a category that um, I think will be influenced by the public. So still um, working on um, improving that. Uh, agriculture and forestry, um, second column at the top. Um, we um, have been adding data that we received from the town and the Scarborough Land Trust to make sure that we have all of the working farms, any agricultural land um, that is in the current use program or that just that we know are working farms are included in our base data. Um, we, for water quality, have our environmental consultant also working with us on that category, making sure that we have everything correctly documented, and we have added state data on aquifers based on the feedback we received from you in May. And then we have our new category, and that is uh, environmental hazards that came up through our discussion. Uh, and so in this category, um, we uh, anticipate having um, FEMA floodplains, so areas that are at risk to flooding, um, steep slopes. I don't know that we've, have we determined the uh, um, uh, percentage of slope, Judy, on what we're looking to be using for that? Is it like a 20% slope or yeah. what are we? We'll use 20% unless people have a feel, strong feeling some other way. <laughs> kind of a standard um, areas that are um, have value based on um, um, the, the grade of the land. Um, so we can use the topo data uh, to identify those areas and then um, make them um, an element that would be within this prioritization mapping. Um, Jess, oh, sorry, please, just to jump please. in, just for context for people, this um, category, the, the concept is um, identifying environmental hazards where we wouldn't necessarily want people to develop so that we can um, prioritize that for conservation and, and make sure that people aren't developing those lands that might be sensitive, um, lands that have steep slopes or, or might be flood prone or whatever else. That's great. Thanks for um, clarifying. Jessica, just while there's a pause, I'm going to mm -hmm. let you finish going through this category, but then I want to acknowledge that Cressy has her hand up, so we'll go to her when you're done going through awesome. this. That's great. Um, I'll just kind of quickly read through these bullets. Um, highly erodible soils, also places we wouldn't necessarily want to develop. Um, the DEP EGAD sites, I don't, maybe Madeline knows what EGAD stands for. It's the, it's the toxic areas, <laughs> brownfields. <laughs> Also, yeah. um, uh, shoreland zones and resource protection zone zones are um, also areas that are already under 
protection where we want there to be less development or controlled development. And so places that may be at risk um, in the same way that FEMA floodplains are at risk. Um, why don't we go over to Cressy? Yeah, Cressy, go ahead. You can unmute. Um, hi, I just, uh, I wanted to go back to the water quality. I know that um, uh, Scarborough Land Trust and formerly Friends of Scarborough Marsh uh, have been participating in something called the Volunteer River Monitoring Program. Mm -hmm. and, uh, there has been data collected on a number of points of, uh, uh, you know, dissolved oxygen, um, also bacteriological, uh, like, you know, E. coli and, um, uh, for 10 years. And I don't know if that data is something that the consultant will look at. Um, and there, you know, that's just, I don't know, a point of um, information on data that's available that might be useful, might be useful to the consultant. I don't know if they, they have any interest in that. It's, it's run by the state. It's a volunteer river monitoring program. And there's about 10 years worth of monitoring around Scarborough and the marsh. Don't know if that would be something that would be useful. Uh, can we get the data? Yes, you can. Send it over. Send it to Jamie. Okay. We'll take a look at it. We'll look at it with with FB Environmental, our environmental consultant. And um... it's on it's on the it's on the state's website. Just thought it might be a point of interest. Uh, it, you know, it indicates, for example, in some instances where there is septic systems that are sort of uh, impacting some of the streams going into uh, into the marsh uh, because of obviously E. coli measurements and and, and, and like that. So I, I thought it might be interesting for you guys to at least look at it. Thank you. Should, okay. should be part of um, the DEP data that um, that you're referencing because the program is managed through DEP. But Correct. sometimes there is a lag between um, what's publicly available and what's been collected. So um, okay. we'll see what we if there's additional information that we can get. Okay. Just thought that it's not that important, but just wondered if that was maybe in the data that um, collected. Okay. I'll double check. Thanks, Cressy. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. So one um, topic of conversation that um, we've been having on our consultant team is um, the relationship between um, environmental hazards, which is sort of the new category that popped up, and um, sea level rise and marsh migration, which is also a form of an environmental hazard. They're kind of the, they're, I would say that sea level rise could be put into the environmental hazards category, but we have left it out as a sixth category to give it prominence, to, to emphasize that as something that is maybe more important than every other category that we see in, um, in the environmental hazards um, or just as a higher weight. So when we put all of these into a value rated system, um, it allows people to think about that as an individual subject, not just embedded deeply within the environmental hazards category, along with uh, steep slopes and um, like spill sites. How does that feel to the committee? Anybody have any comments on that? That's where we're leaning, but I wanna make sure that you have input on the way that um, we categorize all of these categories. <laughs> feel of it separate? Feeling comfortable? I'll start. I'm good with it being separate. I think it it's like you said, it's a little different than steep slopes. <laughs> <laughs> it's important for the community to be thinking about and it's important for us to get feedback on that directly, I think. Um, so the more we can talk about it, the more we can make it real. And I think it's has more value in the dialogue as a separate entity. But that's me, somebody who's very interested in sea level rise adaptation. <laughs> So the question is just whether or not SLR is separate from environmental hazards? Correct. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, think, yeah. I think it makes sense. Okay. Uh, likewise, I do think it makes sense. I think it also sea level rise and marsh migration are sort of a proxy for climate change mm. impacts. Um, I think it's really important to keep those, you know, uh, front and center. Awesome. I agree. I agree. And I think people would have a lot to say about that when we think about public engagement about that particular topic. 
Great. That's what we thought. So we have six as opposed to five. Can I ask a, a question as well? The, it Please. seems like the, the FEMA floodplains are somewhat connected to that. Would, is there any thought of moving um, that into the sea level rise and marsh migration section? I was thinking the same thing, Jamie. We, we can look at it. Um, I think what we'll find is that the FEMA floodplains and the sea level rise data are probably fairly coincident with each other. So they're not gonna, they're not gonna show also, uh, well, that's not actually true because the floodplains by law, we're not allowed to consider sea level rise, right? So, so they're gonna identify areas at the current level where there's flooding um, and they have a certain regulatory impact which is why we put them in environmental hazards. Um, so the sea level rise data is going to give us, again, they'll have similarities just because of they're both being kind of bathtub models of flooding. Um, and so we can look at it and see. Um, my 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 feeling would be that uh, it should be in environmental hazards because it's currently regulated that way, and that the sea level rise and marsh migration information has to do with a future condition that's going to be. True. But we could certainly make that change, uh, or we could use it in both places. It won't be the only layer that's used in more than one place. Like wetlands, for example, I believe yeah. will probably show up in both water quality and in habitat because they they have dual functionality. Great. Thanks for the explanation, Judy. Yep. So the intent is to continue to improve upon these in the same way that we're improving upon the existing open space um, uh, work. Um, so all um, existing open space and resource category data um, uh, will, the, the updates are currently underway. They'll be presented to the public in their form that they are in and at the end of July. Um, at the public workshop, we'll have people uh, uh, be able to look at the maps, comment on them, um, add things that we may have missed, identify additional data sets, much like the committee has here. Um, we'll collect that and then we'll integrate all of the public feedback that we get at the workshop and also that we're, we'll be collecting online as well. And then we'll be presenting those updated maps to you at the August meeting. So today it's just bullet points telling you what we're doing. We're going to be getting more in July. And then when we meet again, um, post engagement, we'll be able to put the data up for you and show you where we're at. So uh, stay tuned. That's just a quick timeline on kind of what to expect on um, seeing the updated maps. Okay, so now we're getting into the next agenda item, which is um, going over the public workshop. And so we'll, um, I have, we have three slides here. The first one um, highlights the three activities that we're going to be doing. We touched on these briefly um, at the May meeting, then we'll go over the detailed agenda and then kind of some expectations from the committee on our third slide. So we see this public workshop having um, three primary engagement opportunities. Um, the first and most passive activity is um, when people come in, they can sign their name um, on the sign up sheet and they can pick up a comment card. And the comment card will be asking them to um, give their definition of open space or what does open space mean to you? We thought this would be a nice thing to do after talking last week about all of the definitions of open space and all the directions we could go. Why not put it out to the public um, to get their bulleted ideas about what it means to them and we can kind of integrate that into our final definition. Um, and then there will be um, what we're calling a mapping activity, and this will be an opportunity for uh, the public to actually look at the data that we've just been talking about. So there will be six tables. Each table will have um, a map, maybe 24 by 36 or 30 by 40, you know, nice big large scale maps printed on the tables and um, we'll give people time to look at the maps. They can write on the maps. We can add sticky notes, dots, points. Um, if there's things that we've missed, they can ask questions about the data. Um, and so this is an opportunity for the public to tell us if there's anything we missed, 
but also more importantly to just familiarize themselves with these six categories, um, understand um, uh, in a little more detail um, what we're talking about as we get into um, asking them about what they value in relation to these resource categories. So interactive activity, helping us with physical maps. And then the third activity is the funding activity. So uh, we have six categories, you see them represented here, each with um, a different colored bucket. And so uh, we envision at the meeting giving every participant the equivalent of $200,000. And so what that will look like is 20 $10,000 bills. So they will have uh, 20 pieces of paper and they will have six categories. We thought that was like a nice ratio of like not being too much, but enough that you could get some like uh, hierarchy going on between the six categories. And they will have to decide where they want to spend their money. What is the most important thing for them to protect with the funds that they have? It may all be equal. Uh, there may be, they may want to put all $200,000 into Habitat because that's the only thing they care about. Um, and so uh, people will uh, be able to, in effect, vote for where they want the money to go. We'll then total up all of the money in each of the categories at the uh, end of this activity. We'll then put the um, value ratings of the money spent amongst everybody at the meeting into the software that Judy will be in charge of. And then she'll be using that to actually update uh, the first draft of a potential prioritization map. So we'll be able to show it on the screen. It's not final. We will have, um, of course, meetings with you guys to talk about it. We will have um, digital engagement, but this is just so that everybody understands how we arrive at that prioritization um, based on a declaration of values by the group. Any questions or comments or suggestions? Sounds like a great public meeting. I really like the <clears throat> idea of posing the same dilemma to the public with the dollars and having to prioritize them according to the um, categories. It, it, it's, I'm interested to see the outcome. And I really like the uh, keeping them very involved in, um, and not just uh, talking heads. I think that's important. Yeah, we want people to come and have fun. And I assume like the mapping activity will kind of get them thinking and familiar with what they're going to be doing in the next kind of value. Totally. Activity. So, so here's they'll have a, a level of knowledge that they can make some of those decisions. Exactly. So just here's the agenda. And this is what we're thinking. So five to seven, we have a two hour window. We have a sign in table. That's when, um, I guess that's kind of always there, but it's when people are coming in and that's where they can pick up their comment card and they can keep that with them, fill it out at their own leisure. We'll have a, um, a presentation. We have allotted a 30 minute presentation because it's like, hey, this is the project. Here's where we're going. Here's our timeline. Introduce people to the project and then introduce people to the mapping activity specifically. So not revealing everything up front. We'll maybe make reference to it, but um, getting everybody oriented to these resource categories, how we want them to be thinking about them, um, and then sort of releasing them to the tables. And then half an hour into the meeting at 530 is when we release everybody. It becomes more of an open house. People can wander to the tables that are of interest to them. They can spend a full 30 minutes talking about habitat. They can spend uh, five minutes at each table um, to give their um, uh, feedback or look at the data. At six o'clock, uh, we then um, come back to sort of presentation format, and we spend 15 minutes orienting people to the next activity. So you've seen this data, here's your money. At that time, we'll probably be moving those maps over to an area where it's they're kind of like set up in maybe a linear fashion um, with buckets associated with them. So those physical maps that they just drew on will kind of become the placemats for where the money collection <laughs> locations will be. Um, and then we give them 15 minutes to decide how they're going to spend $200,000. They drop the money in at 630. They then have 15 minutes to grab a beverage, to maybe fill out their comment card, continue to look at the maps, continue to talk about things. It's kind of basically, it's 15 minutes for us to get our act together, counting money, um, updating the map so that we have something to present. That's going to be our most intense 15 minutes. 
<laughs> as consultants. And then at the end, 6.45, um, we have 15 minutes to say, hey team, thank you for your input. Here's how much money went into each category. Here's what a draft prioritization map would look like if we finished this project today. Uh, and here's where you can go to continue to contribute your ideas online, share with your friends. Thank you, we'll see you online and have everybody out the door by seven o'clock. When do you plan to collect the uh, comment cards on what an open space is? I'm just thinking that it might be helpful to have them have the presentation before they fill it out. I think that it'll just be a box and they can leave it when they leave. Like they can leave it the last thing they do, they can leave it. Um, I don't even have a problem with them taking it home and having a place to have a box at, you know, in the planning department at town hall, if they wanted to come back and, um, or, you know, take a picture of it and email it later. Um, it can be very fluid. I'd go ahead. I just could just quickly, um, with the presentation and the introduction, is there going to be somebody available to uh, educate and instruct people as they come in late because five o'clock is that work time frame and so when I think public workshop it's either I can drop in at any time mm -hmm. or you know I'm here for a two-hour period so how do we me message market that so people understand what that looks like and what their commitment is uh so that's a great question first of all I guess gut check how does the five o'clock start time feel to everybody like would we be better off doing this from six to eight if because it isn't really a drop in it's really something we want people to show up to so we can adjust as needed to fit what you guys think would work for the public um and then the marketing piece of it uh that's also a really great point we might just want to on the posters that we make as part of our advertisement we may just want to make that clear that that's um it's less of an open house and more of a commitment i mean there's i suppose you could drop in you're just not going to get the full right. extent how does it i'll weigh in and say i think that six to eight it probably makes more sense and i think that aligns with a lot of our town committee meetings um town council workshops and meetings and things like that i think people are used to that time frame well let's do six to eight then that's easy um andrew first and then karen uh, I just had uh, two questions. One was about the maps. Um, are the maps going to have parcel data? Um, how are we going to kind of keep this big picture as opposed to, um, you know, I want to protect this individual parcel here or, or that's my parcel. You can't tell me what to do with it kind of thing. Um, and then the second, what is the role of the committee at this workshop? Do we want to talk about the parcel data first? Um, I don't think we were planning on having parcel data on anything, right? I mean, yeah, generally, I would say in a in a meeting like this, I tend to avoid putting it on for the very reasons you just said. <laughs> so we'll have roads so people can figure out where they are. Um, but the idea is that we're trying to create this general sense of where is the most where are the general most important places to protect and then it's not going to be by parcel and so the only way that the only parcels that will show up are ownership ones that are already in you know will be showing the land that's already in conservation so you'll see those parcels but we won't have the, par the all the parcel lines on there and the same thing will be true like with the farms and like tree growth and you know those kinds of parcels um but in general uh, we won't have the parcels showing on the maps. Yeah, under recreation and connectivity, we would have um, like existing recreation areas that might show up as a, as parcels. Um, and here, Ag and Forestry, as she mentioned, if there are working farms. Um, but I think but none of the them only... will show all the parcel lines. No, yet. and I think those are the only two that really relate to parcel lines, unless like Scarborough Marsh is a singular parcel or something like that as a habitat. I don't know. But then, um, Andrew, does that answer your question, or do you want do you need any, anything else related to parcels? Uh, no, that's good. I was just curious. And then uh, the role of the committee in the meeting. So um, be at the workshop, be present and listen and take notes. 
Um, I think if we have six tables set up, um, we can have our consultant team. There's three of us. And then we have three members of the town that can kind of like man each of those as like the sole uh, like rep to stand there and talk to people about the data. Um, but that would place us kind of squarely at those, which doesn't allow us to be floaters and like listening for a half an hour as to what the conversations are that are happening at these different tables. So um, if I think it's really valuable to just have extra ears and um, engagement and note taking from the committee. Um, Jamie, do we have enough to man that um, like the sign in table with the comment card, I feel like somebody should be there maybe the whole time. So maybe we need a seventh person to kind of be there, you know, so maybe if there's a volunteer, I don't know. Yeah, we um, if, if a committee member is interested in that or we can talk amongst our um, our staff to see town staff to see if someone um, wants to be kind of the the greeter and the person to orient people um, that may come in late. I'll also say if there are committee members who have a particular expertise in one of the areas um, that that is being shown on the maps, it may make sense for that person to to staff that map. Um, so if anyone has a particular area of expertise or um, interest, um, I'm I think it, it would be fine to have a committee member um, manning or at least participating in that in mapping station. Jamie, I'll do check in if you want me to. <laughs> Thanks, Todd. Sure. <laughs> oh, yeah, we have four staff. This is great. <laughs> I figure uh, if we're going to have a six o'clock meeting, we'll make sure we'll as a consultant team, we'll show up with all the materials at five o'clock. So we'll have an hour to set up um, if the committee members are able to come a little on the earlier side so they can be there and understand and ask any questions and kind of um, help sort of uh, softly facilitate the flow, um, you know, showing up at 545 or 530 to be ready for it. Great, uh, Karen Shoup. Sure, thank you. So remind me where the open house is, is it at the public safety building? That's what I am shooting for. I haven't been able to, I can't reserve it until 30 days out. So. Um, okay, so I guess I'm thinking about the open house and we just actually had an open house for the community center and I have a couple concerns. I, I know typically, I, I mean, I guess I think it's a big commitment to ask people to come for two hours straight to make a commitment to this to get some feedback from residents. I'm concerned that will turn some people away where I just don't have the time to do that, where if we're running it from like five to seven, they can stop by on their way home, give some feedback and not have to make a two hour commitment. I'm concerned we're going to miss some feedback if we present it as a two hour workshop that you're committed to. Um, and so I think we got and how that the community center one went was like the committee members were there kind of having conversations and giving feedback and things like that. And I don't know how this committee feels about that, where um, I am, I, I'm not sure how this typically goes for an open space, open house, but, um, and I, so then I think what is this, if we do structure it this way, you know, to Todd's point, like how are we gonna manage people coming in late? Cause I, I, will there be maps still available at 6 PM if someone rolls in late and is only there for the funding activity. I mean, maybe it's not part of your final results, but it's something that you could walk away with. So I don't, I'm, I want, maybe we could clarify about people coming in late, people who want to drop in, because I do feel what will deter people if it's like you have to come for two hours. Um, and I don't want to miss that feedback. So I think we can leave the maps up, like we can leave them on the tables so that it is, and maybe this is also where the committee um, or the, the um, Todd at the, at the uh, entry desk can kind of direct people um, to kind of these tables in the back. Like if they come in and we're in the middle of explaining the funding activity, like if they come in at, you know, 615 and that's the presentation, they've like kind of missed the whole setup as to exactly like why we're talking about funding in these categories. Um, but the maps could still be there, you know, like so it, they wouldn't be gone. You could in fact effectively do the same thing. Um, I also want to, um, I guess I'd also identify that in, I know it's a two hour meeting, but it, once you vote, I mean, basically you're sticking around at 6.30, you could walk out the door and it's not gonna change anything other than you're not gonna see what the final result looks like, right? Because we're making people basically hang out for another half an hour to, vis to see the visual representation of what they've done as a group. So um, 
the collection of ideas ends at 6.30. So it's an hour and a half of, to get, so I, I might leave at that point if I was trying to get home to my kids and be and like, I'll just see this later. Earth, yeah, I don't know if Wentworth would be available because we had good luck with people coming to pick up their kids for summer camp, or at that point it was cool to drop off or pick up at the end of the day. And we did, we were able to draw some people in because of that specific location as well. So I just wanted to throw that out there as well. Do you have any, um, where is summer camp held? That That's at Wentworth. It is so at Wentworth? We, yeah, so I think in, um, I, it's not super, super busy where it would be clouded, um, but. I just don't, like, are they using the cafeteria for that time? Because if. I'd have to I check on the Ask date Todd. and the location. I mean, as far as the schedule on that particular date, I can check with camp. Thank you. Yeah, Wentworth was was on my list of possibilities. Um, if if we weren't able to get into public safety, that's a bigger space too. So maybe it would make sense um, to do it in Wentworth if we need to spread out a little bit more than public safety. Um, Autumn and then Karen Martin. Uh, thanks. I was just going to ask if we could also create some sort of an online version of this that we could uh, publish on our website so people could still, if they weren't able to come to the meeting, they could still see the presentation afterwards and um, maybe do the funding activity virtually in some fashion. I thought that might be a good idea, especially for people with summer and kids. And also, I can totally volunteer to be the person for late people and put them in the right place and explain. I'm, I'm good at that stuff. <laughs> yeah, I guess um, I think this the intent was to have an online version of this also, um, so that if people aren't able to attend the open house, um, that we're still able to collect their um, the, their input and feedback. Okay, yeah. we're still set for that. Yeah, yeah. that's on that's okay. agenda item like four. We'll get oh, okay. that's the Great. next thing we're gonna talk about. We'll go through that. So you'll see cool. what that you'll see what the digital looks like. And I I think I'd encourage people, even if they've participated in the public meeting, if there's something that you missed, you're rethinking <laughs> the way that you voted at the public meeting, then get online and do it again. And so I would also say maybe we have people, um, I don't know who brought it up, but I think we should probably at the sign-in table give them the card and then have them give us back their definition of open space at the end as they're leaving instead of when they get, because because it'll be an education process, even if they only oh, yeah. 20 minutes, you know, that Definitely. can be one thing we get. So yep. that's a, a good way to get them to at least stick around for some some information. Like they may not get to it until they have their short break and then mm -hmm. they finally have a minute to sit down and write it down over. Karen Martin. Yes, that was essentially my question as well. How can we deal with um, um, online folks? And so Autumn was describing how we can get people going afterwards. Is there anything that we could do like in a separate room of... Um, you know, with the online folks to sort of have a conversation amongst them. Um, and I'm not exactly sure how that would go, but um, I'm just trying to think if people are viewing this, how could so we we're not going to do a, we weren't intending to do a Zoom portion okay. of this. This would be in person only. And then there will be an option um, to do it online as a, like a, basically okay. an, a survey um, kind of thing, but not doing a, a Zoom portion to the workshop. Okay. Why don't we, or do we have more questions? Yep, there's a couple more. Okay. Karen, your hand is is still up. Is that something additional? Okay, um, and Maggie. Um, hi. Um, have you in the in when you've done this in other uh, municipalities? Have you um, have you done it as a drop in thing? And how, if if so, how was that structured rather than a a two hour block? And then the other question is, and how many, when you've done this as a two-hour block, with a lot of communication, how many people show up? We just did a similar project in downtown Bangor, a little different. We didn't have funding. It was really just the mapping. Um, so there was a 30-minute presentation in the beginning, and then we left kind of 90 minutes at the end um, for the mapping. It was, it was more mapping-based because it was a downtown activity. And I think we probably had maybe 30 to 40 people that came to that. Um, and they sort of petered out over time. What do you see, Judy, with your engagement stuff? Yeah, I would say we've been in doing an activity like this 
60, 70, sometimes a little bit more than that. Um, the one in Bangor was a uh, neighborhood specific, so it wasn't really advertised to the whole to the whole town. So the 30 or 40 was a particular neighborhood. Um, but in recently in the towns I've been working in doing it this way, we've gotten somewhere between 60 and 70, maybe 100 people. Most of those towns have been smaller than Scarborough. So, you know, it's hard to know exactly how many people would show up. Um, and I would say that uh, doing it as an open house is a, is a totally different meeting. <laughs> so we'd have to reorganize the meeting because you wouldn't be able, you really wouldn't be able to do the funding activity um, with people dropping in because they won't hear the, the, the why there's six categories and what's in them and why you might want to spend money on, you know, different categories to try to get at people's values. And so if that's the part that we want to get to with people, I think you have to have some time for people to spend time with the maps and have that discussion. Um, if you were going to do it as an open house, you'd probably just look at the maps and you really, it would be much more difficult in a drop-in situation to do the, the funding activity part of it. Um, so we could still have the funding activity online, so you could do it that way. But um, I haven't had, we have not had a great amount of drop off. I will say that my personal opinion is that it was, it's really important that the town uh, have uh, babysitting. So you can get a couple high school kids. We make, we usually make maps for the kids to draw on about what they're, what they'd like to see. Um, and usually not that many show up, but I think it's a good policy <laughs> so that people who have kids can bring them with them. Um, and they just have, we just have a table set up in the corner with crayons and maps. And then if the town can find high school kids who need community service points, uh, it works out perfectly. <laughs> um, but just a thought. I'm just trying to figure out if there's a way to combine, um, uh, uh a solid block with a drop in and I I'm not sure what that could look like. I mean, just people could stay just through the mapping activity. Yeah, right. So they could decide not to stay for the funding activity and people who don't have the time will I mean, right. that's my guess is that, you know, if people can come, they'll come at the beginning. Um, you know, sometime between five and six, and they'll, you know, maybe participate in looking at some of the maps and then they'll leave. So it will act like an open house in that sense. Mm -hmm. So and the, we the digital. have, go oh, okay. We're gonna say, when yeah. we go over the digital, yeah. We could have little handouts with a QR code if people mm -hmm. need to like leave and have them at the sign out table. If they have to exit, we can hand them a handout and say, if you wanna add, contribute anymore or participate in the funding activity here, here's our online site because mm -hmm. we'll be doing that anyway for the um, event-based engagement we'll have mm -hmm. handouts with qr codes on how to go online so we need to develop it anyway we'll have it ready for the public meeting that's that's a great idea and then the only other thing i can think of is i think we need to have food there will be food <laughs> and if you're if we're trying to have kids uh because if you know people gather around food and if they're mm -hmm. trying to have um something for kids maybe a little bit of kids food too yeah, I, depending on, yeah, we'll, we'll talk it among staff about maybe some logistics for childcare because initially, I think initially we were thinking it would be open house. So it would be kind of a drop in uh, less time commitment. So we weren't thinking childcare, but um, knowing a, a two hour block and I honestly, I, I like the, the flow of it. Um, I think we'll, We'll regroup as um, as town staff and see what we can do in terms of um, in terms of child care so that hopefully we can get some good um, community participation um, for a two hour block or hour and a half block. Andrew. Yeah, I'm just going to reinforce that, Jamie, we did a meeting and one of the past communities I lived in and we provided child care and it was in a separate room and uh, we had some of the town educators um and they had games and activities for the kids and the parents could put kids in that room and then go into the other room and participate in the process
Also, I, I think it's important for, to think about. I might volunteer to hang out with the kids instead of the adults. <laughs> if you're it's, late to the meeting, you July. go to the. Yeah, if you're right? late to the so, meeting, you come yeah, with Autumn. You go to the kids. You, you go to the kids you room. Them you're out. late. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is summer, so yeah, kids are around. Uh, let's talk about the event-based and then the digital, because I think it's going to inform kind of like both of these elements being available for the um, the public workshop. Um, okay, so I know that we have some events that we're going to be piggybacking on, on to. One is uh, Scarborough Summerfest, and then we have concerts in the park. And that first concert in the park is actually, bef is that right, 7-11 and 7-18? Do I have that wrong? Is it 6-11? No, no there's 7 they're 7 11 7 okay okay so just back to back yeah and so they actually start next week or the week after so we're missing um the the first couple knowing that we're probably not going to be ready for them so yeah but we could definitely be ready by so there will be two concert in the parks before um we actually meet on 7 25 and um then one right afterwards so we can use those first two to actually advertise for that big that public meeting um which i hadn't thought about uh, in terms of this, this time and sequencing but um our thought was that um we have um you know some kind of pop-up shelter or something um and that you could um uh, first of all, give people handouts that have a QR code to direct them to the online engagement, which we'll get to in a moment. Um, we could also have a poster that has kind of these six um, resource categories, and maybe it's not like the detailed data because it's a lot to take in, um, but kind of just the ideas like trails versus habitat versus sea level rise, like all of these things. And then um, at the booth, you could hand out stickers and people could just put stickers on the things that they think are most important. So we can kind of get just like a really simplistic kind of value um, ranking. They can see where other stickers are and, you know, be influenced by what the what other people are saying. So that would just kind of be like a fun, easy thing to do in the booth and then direct people to engage online and advertise about the upcoming public meetings for those first two. So um, we won't have consultant staff, but consultants can provide the materials uh, and we can work with you, Jamie, to make sure you get it to the right people who would be at yeah, those that booths. that would be great. Um, Emerson is actually going to be kind of leading the, um, the engagement, uh, the, um, the event-based engagement stuff for us. So she'll Perfect. be um, there um, and we are... As we mentioned at the last meeting, um, we need some committee members to um, to participate in those events as well. So um, it would be helpful to have one or two additional people um, with Emerson. Um, thank you, Cressy. Cressy's already volunteered okay. to help. Um, Jamie, just what, to help. Oh, go ahead, Karen. Uh, so I was just going to say, uh, of all of those concerts, the seven eighteen concert is going to be the biggest one. That's Motor Booty Affair. And so that Ooh. just brings out everybody and their mother. So uh, it's, it's a huge. In, in fro wigs. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So that is, the, that is the biggest event. So that's the one that you, you have the most chance of getting the most amount of people. Well, that's great because we'll have one to practice. Yes. <laughs> so we'll, uh, we'll be well versed and ready to go for the 18th. That's good feedback to have. Thanks, Karen. So maybe we'll want a few. Um, community or uh, committee members to um, plan to attend the, the concert on the 18th. Um, if we're expect, if we expect people to, uh, to drop in. Um, and that was some of the feedback that we received, you know, don't approach people, let them come to us, which I think would have been our approach anyway. Um, you know, there'll be other groups um, set up, um, but there's Jim space for us. And Jamie, I'm already there on the 18th. So um, you can count me in. Thanks, Karen. So um, I think Emerson will probably um, send out an email to the committee after this meeting just to get people um, see who will sign up for which dates. Um, Cressy says she's going to try to do all three. So thanks, Cressy. Um, and then uh, we will see kind of, I think, where things stand um, and figure out about Summerfest. Um, if we, you know, need to do, um, see how our, um, how our engagement is looking. If, um, I mean, all of these events are going to hit different cross sections of the community. So um, it would be, Summerfest is probably still a good one to, to plan to attend also. Jamie, um, 
I have it on my calendar that uh, July 18th is the tentative date for the main turnpike meeting. Is that still the possible date? Um, that's a good question for Autumn, I guess. I haven't heard. Yeah, Andrew, that's the same date I have as tentative as well. That's a terrible Which, date for that. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> we don't make people choose between motor booty and the turnpike. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Turnpike loses every time. <laughs> Turnpike's gonna lose. I don't know that it will this time. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should. I'll, I'll talk to someone about that. <laughs> Could be a timing yeah. thing whenever, yeah. you know, because the concert really doesn't start till 630 or so. And if the Turnpike thing is earlier. So we'll see. It's probably the exact same time. I bet. I'm going to send an email now. <laughs> Thank you for calling attention to that, Andrew. Do we want to jump into the digital stuff so you can see what that looks like or what it will yes. look like? Okay. So I think I'm going to, I'll show this side quickly and then turn it, my screen over to Madeline. You ready to go to share the digital stuff? Cool. Oh, yeah. So basically we have a, a website that will be our launch pad. Any QR codes where people would scan, it will take them to the website, give a little introduction to the project with buttons that they can click on within the website to go to engage um, and give their feedback. So there will be two methods um, of data collection. It's the same two methods that we have at the public meeting. Uh, and that is uh, opportunities to add points to a digital map of places that we should consider or think about around open space conservation. And then there is the funding activity. Um, slightly different, but ultimately it's the same categories, uh, same way of, of distribution. So um, we will be providing links to these, obviously at the workshop, at the event-based um, work that we just talked about and I think the intent is for this we'll open these things up in early July and we'll have them go to like at least Summerfest maybe it's um, you know to give people enough time maybe a week after Summerfest we can kind of close it out um, so through the whole summer I'm gonna stop sharing oh um oh okay perfect Affirmation. okay so like Jessica was talking about um, we'll have a sort of landing page um, for the open space plan. And so we don't have one put together yet, but um, this is a good example of one that we did for that Bangor project that we were talking about. Um, Are you going to share your screen? Did I share my screen? Oh, oh no, sorry, it's just me. I'm, I'm bad, my bad. I had you, <laughs> I had you covered up. Sorry. Oh, can everybody see that OK? OK, cool. Um, so having a sort of landing spot with a little introduction to uh, the project and why we're doing what we're doing, why it's important. Um, having a space to advertise the public meeting. Um, and so we can pop the poster that we make up there. Um, and then we have talked about having like some of the um, data for the different um, resource categories so that people can explore that if they want to dig in a little bit more and get some more information about that. But the main point of the site is to have a spot for people to have one link to get to both of the different digital engagement activities. So we'll have a button for a, a mapping activity like the one at the public meeting and a button for a funding activity sort of like the one at the public meeting. Um, so, just to show you what the mapping activity might look like. And both of these are drafts, so bear with me. Um, but we'll have a survey sort of like this where you um, have a little bit of an intro. People are able to zoom in and drop a pen or type in an address, and then are able to tell us like why they picked that point, um, why it matters for open space. Maybe they have an area that they think is really good habitat or would be great for having a trail connection between different trails um, or would be a great recreation area. Um, so it just gets people involved in the process of thinking about um, open space in their town. And it sort of serves a slightly different purpose since we don't have all of the data up there and the maps for um, each of the categories, but it still gets people thinking spatially about open space. Um, and we can refine that any questions before I move on to the 
funding activity. So, Madeline, just to clarify, will you have the, the maps up there um, that relate to the funding categories, or this is just going to be uh, tell us um, where you think the important spaces are in Scarborough? Um, we won't for this survey, but we'll have data on the story map. And it's a little bit difficult to have all of that data in this one map. Um, and so sort of in lieu of that, of that, we're having this, we'll have this little introduction that talks about the different categories. And maybe we could have a link that goes back to the um, story map that has all of those different resource category maps and data. Um, so we can think about how to make that more equivalent. Okay. One thing that we talked about in making this um, was after you drop your pin, we could have a drop down so that you can select what category that pin is in. So you can say like, this is habitat or this is recreation or this is water quality. Um, mm -hmm. It got a little bit, um, we didn't want to confuse, like if it was a wetland, it would be habitat and it would, could be water quality. And so I didn't want to make like a hurdle for people trying to figure out what category things would fit into. So we left it very open-ended and then we could take just what they tell us and we could categorize that like after the fact. Um, but that's a feature we can easily add in to get people thinking about the categories as they're doing. And I think, I think keeping it simple is probably fine, um, but others may have another opinion. I think we'll also uh, add to the, like, to this map, like putting on the existing conservation land. So people yeah. can, so that will help them orient themselves. Um, you know, so there'll be some data on there. It just won't be all data because that would just be confusing. Right. Right. And Cressy, go ahead. So when someone drops a pin, will there be like a little dialogue box where they can say why, make a note? So, mm -hmm. can, so just, I like the idea of it being open so they could say, this is why I think this spot is important or that will be part right. of it. Yeah, yeah, this dialogue box or this box right here, people will be able to type a comment and then that'll be attached to this pin for us. Okay. So. Got it. And there will be some basic data on maybe where the conservation areas are, maybe where the public recreation areas are on this map. Yep. So, yeah. Yeah. That's, that answers that question. Perfect. Madeline, go, go oh, back go. to the um, website just so that, um, and go to the map, like the bigger map. I know this is downtown Bangor, so it's like very different context, but, <laughs> um, and we didn't have any layers here because all we wanted people in this sense to know like where we're talking about, um, very different plan. But um, as I understand it, there can be layers here so we can have like a, a layers menu pop out from the side just like the online GIS is for um, Scarborough and there will be a category on habitat and a category on water quality and a category so we can have all this data there and we can direct people to explore the data in this larger format map and then they can um, go to the survey so that there will be a, ch a chance to see the same data it'll just not and, be in that tiny little map. And we can also put the PDFs of the maps that we yeah. have at the public meeting on the website. So people who don't, you know, if this gets, if it gets confusing right, to yeah. people, they could just click on a PDF that says habitat map. And then right. they'll be able to see that map that was the same map everybody looked at. Yep, that's another good point. So the website will be a chance to share what we know about the town. Like this is where we know the habitat is and this is where we know the, you know, the existing open space is. And then um, in theory, they're looking at that first and then jumping over and dropping in their pins in that next application. Yeah, I would like to have the option to have the layers included in that primary map so that, you know, if people who may be a little bit more um, savvy or familiar with GIS may want to turn on multiple layers and see some overlaps and things like that. So um, yeah, I think that that would be helpful, but to have it basically start as kind of a blank canvas and let people kind of navigate what they want to see. Yep. We can do that. Yeah. Okay. Um, any more questions before I move on to the funding? 
All right. Yeah, one one question. Is it um would it be helpful for this group to review the online ourselves and um just to give you feedback and kind of pilot test it? Yeah, I think we should um shoot to have this developed by the end of the month. So plenty of time before the well, I guess we have our first um uh concert oh, in the that. park on the eleventh. So I think um We'll have to look at the time. We'll talk about time frame, but yeah, we can we, at least by we the. We have it done by the end of the month. Yeah, then that'll you give us some have time. like a week to review it for us, and we can make last minute changes. Right. It will technically be live, so just like don't share it with anybody. Yeah. <laughs> until, don't spread like, it. Or... Yeah, just like you'll get a link to it. Um, <laughs> yeah, I would say I, if you're a, because it's the week of the fourth, like real quick um mm. if you're able to get it to us by like june 26th maybe so that there are a couple of days before that july 4th week for um people to take a look at it and give feedback if that's if that's too close you know we'll we can adjust but if that can be the target that would be helpful i think let's shoot for that target and madeline we'll talk offline to see how much that throws a wrench in your game but i think that's probably that's not unfair. unreasonable yeah <laughs> <sighs> okay. Um. <laughs> Sorry, Madeline. You can tell who's okay. responsible for the digital engagement on this team. No, it's great. It's great. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, um, then let's get to the other thing. So, um, cause this one, I think people might have comments on or want to review. So this is the funding activity. Um, and so we, um, have included a, a short little thing that will collect some demographic data and we can talk about whether or not you think that or the group thinks that that's important to have because I know certain communities like it, it varies by community whether or not like it's important to know that you reach all of the different groups um, and talk to um, or got gathered information from a, a good spread of people. Um, but these questions just ask about if you're a resident, if you live or how long you've lived full or part-time in Scarborough, your age, the number of kids you have in your house, and like whether you want to add your um, email to get updates on the project. Um, so we can talk about, you know, are that, is that too many questions? Is that a barrier to people continuing on and doing the funding activity? Or if, um, if you think that those questions are important or one or two of them are. Um, and then the actual funding activity um, will have a little explanation. And I haven't changed this yet, but it'll uh, be equivalent to the funding activity um, in the public meeting where you'll have uh, 20 $10,000 bills that will add up to $200,000 so that people still feel like this is a weighty decision, but it's in like you have 20 somethings to spend. Um, so it's manageable. So people, um, and we'll have images or like little thumbnails, so it's fun looking, but people can enter in, like I want to spend five whatevers on Habitat, five on forestry or, um, you know, however many on all of these different categories. And this only lets them enter digits and um, a number zero through 20. And then if they go over budget, it'll tell them and they can't submit until they bring it in. And um, <laughs> so we have some guardrails on there. People won't be entering in um, all sorts of numbers or whatever. So this is, yeah. Do we have any questions about this format and how this works? Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Karen. So the only thing that makes me a little uncomfortable is the term budget activity. And I'm wondering mm -hmm. if it might be more descriptive, say, investment activity or something like that, so that people don't get confused, like, wait, we just passed a budget. And um, uh, right. Karen may funding, have more feedback on that. Yeah. Like f funding activity? Sure. That's what we called it in the public meeting. Yeah. I, can... I, I do like investment, though, because I mm -hmm. think it's more positive and it, I think yeah. it may align with some of the terminology that's being used like that. for the um, um, the land bond 
talking about that as an as an investment and while it's it's separate from this but still related i think it would be helpful to have similar terminology can we put yeah. the word prioritization in there investment prioritization activity or is that too many words or just maybe investment priorities yeah you can do that and i i think it's still okay to say at the end that you know if they if they overspent, you can say over budget, but just this yeah. very top just needs to right. have that investment word to sort of set the stage. And I, I agree. I like that uh, terminology better. Um, any more thoughts about this or about whether or not to ask um, demographic questions at the beginning? I would say as long as they're not required, I think it's okay to ask. Okay. Is there any value in asking them after the activity? Like they've already done, like this would be page one and then that would be page two. Um, I just yeah. wasn't, like sometimes I'm, I get to a survey and I'm like, ugh, I don't wanna fill out all this right. stupid information. I just like, right. I get like, uh, I don't have five minutes to give. Right. But if I get right. to something where I immediately, I'm like, oh, I'm, my opinion matters here, as opposed to who are you and how old are you and where do you live and who you have kids. Um, maybe that would like take down a barrier of time. Yeah. 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 I think that's great. Especially if, um, like, even if they don't fill out the, um, demographic information, as long as we're still capturing their, um, their import, the, their feedback. Mm -hmm. So yeah, putting that up front, I think makes the most sense. Are there any other uh, demographic questions that you would want us to ask? Or are these the appropriate questions that will help? Yeah. Do they do they offer anything to you in terms of understanding who's answering? This? Uh, Madeline, can you scroll down so we can see more of them? Yeah. Are you a resident of Scarborough? How long have you lived in Scarborough? What is your age? How many people under 18 live in your house? And then just uh, the email question. So just from a demographic standpoint, you know, do you wanna change 60 or at least have a 65 plus rather than a 60 plus? It just, yes, for yeah. funding opportunities <laughs> and things like that, 65 is a, uh, is nice to be able to match up with the um, uh, town demographics. Yeah. Yes, we can do that. I don't have any problem with these questions, um, but I would ask ourselves, how are we going to display the data if we're not going to break down the data into these categories? And I wouldn't ask the questions. Well, I think it might be helpful to for like internally to know what cross section of the population is responding like to the cert to the online survey. Whether... Can we ask, would it be helpful then to know about um, diversity demographics or education demographics? Yeah, I was curious about the same. Well, and then I think we should be prepared to answer at least or maybe frame it up uh, about how this data could be used. Andrew's point about so if how are we using this data because that what that often um, makes me want to stop giving it if I if I don't know that yeah with other towns when we've collected this data um, it's just been used as a tool to make sure that we're reaching um, enough of each demographic and not like we're not taking you know maybe only people mm -hmm. uh, 60 plus or people in the age group of like 30 to 39 are answering this. Um, and we want to make sure that we're reaching like all of the different uh, population groups. We're not discounting anybody. Um, so it's a good like indicator of like, are we, are we doing enough to reach folks? Um, so that's one, one way it could be used. 
I think that makes total sense, and that's what they would do in a validated survey, but I guess to everybody's point, because we kind of just had the same questions being asked in a couple different surveys, is if it if we're not going to go back out and try to gather the the demographic groups that we don't reach, then why does it, you know, why does this data matter in the sense of if all of a sudden all we get is 50 to 59s and it doesn't depict a, a broad range of ages or 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 whatever we're trying to get why are we well, then we'll know we'll have to advertise the uh the survey on TikTok. yes true <laughs> but i guess or, that's my point you know what i mean yeah. if we're not going to then take the next step and go to try to obtain that data you know what i mean um right what I, what about if we took the age out and we just wanted to know uh, how long they've lived here are they full-time or a resident and then i'm interested in knowing how many people under the age of 18 live in their household so i think yeah. that'll be telling about what they will prioritize i think that yeah. would be useful information you know if 50 percent of the respondents say open space is all about recreation then we have something to frame up but <laughs> i'm not really yeah. interested in like how old people are yeah uh, i don't know if we'll do anything with that so i yeah. would say if you're going to if you're going to take out age and you're going to just say how many people under age 18 live in your house, I would ask the the opposite end of that spectrum too. how many people over uh, 65 or over live in your house, um, because we know that from census data, too. So we can we can look at that to see how that matches up with town data. And I do think, you know, um, Todd, you may have more uh, uh, sensitivity about this than, than others. Certainly, you've got a group of seniors who are active in planning recreation. Yeah, it's just more about we, we've just collected so much data. Yeah. And uh, again, some of the groups are asking, what are we doing with it? How do we receive it? Why are you collecting? I mean, it's just, mm -hmm. again, and to the point of what we said it before is, what's really most important so I can spend my time wisely versus just clicking buttons because we're clicking buttons. So, mm -hmm. so the other ways. That so you could use the data to look to see if there's a difference of opinion between right. people of one age group versus another age group. So you can certainly do that. You could choose not to do that. Um, another question that uh, you, that might be interesting is uh, you know putting a map of the town broken into broad neighborhood or sections and ask people, do you live, you know, on the coast? Do you live? on the far western side do you live in the center you know do you live along route one like where do you where do you live without having them identify exactly where they live but what neighborhood are they from uh to like see that. if you're getting a broad cross section of so if age isn't the important thing is it is it important to know that you're reaching people across the spectrum of the town yeah i like that idea too we do that a lot, actually, especially for like uh, open space and then uh, parks and rec surveys where you want to know, like, yeah, where people want their facilities in relation to where they live. Um, is that really a, I, I, Jamie, if you could get us like um, what, what makes sense for the community? I know different communities have different like, yeah, South Portland's very neighborhoody and they know exactly what neighborhood they live in. But in others, it might just be east and west or the village or the Route 1 We're corridor. Both. You're of both. Course. OK, <laughs> keep it as simple as possible. The lowest common denominator, like what would everybody be able to identify as their zone? Yeah, I was going to ask if this is going to be set so that like only one household can like are you going to limit one per ip address or something like that i don't imagine someone's going to want to jump in there and skew the results or anything <laughs> like that um but if the, there was any thought to that yeah the way i've dealt with that is for the most part uh the one and only time i tried to limit it to one ip address it turned out that like half the people were teachers and their ip <laughs> address came through the school and so <laughs> that didn't work very well <laughs> so we had to undo that um, so I would say that what we do is we keep the IP address as a, as, as data that gets collected so that we can scroll through and look and see like if one IP address has 60 answers, oh yeah, that's the school. Okay. No big deal. Or that's the library. No big deal. Right. Um, but I've never in all the years I've been doing this ever seen anybody try to skew the results. <laughs> with multiple answers. We're always lucky we can get people to answer once. It's right, very yeah. unlikely that anybody's <laughs> gonna answer eight times. 
but we do have the data so that we can look at it and and see if anything looks amiss okay yeah cool. the only time that we've had any trouble with people um people responding who shouldn't be responding and having an ip address outside of the country is when one time we offered a 50 dollars gift card to ll bean and mm -hmm. that really <laughs> <laughs> Drew and the scammers, but since we're not offering anything, it doesn't really do much. Not likely. <laughs> yeah. So the demographic questions to just kind of summarize, um, we want to know where people live within the community. And then um, if there are members of the household under the age of 18, and if there are members of the household over 65, Yes. Mm -hmm. So there's just three questions. One, two, three. Do we want to know about residency and length of residency? Okay. Yeah, I think so. Or or definitely at least if they're a resident or a visitor. Um, yeah. What are what's the committee's thoughts on how long they've been in Scarborough, if they're a resident? I think it needs to go well beyond twenty years. I think it could go. Some people have been here for probably their whole lives, I would imagine. So maybe- Yeah, I think there would be a plus on that 20. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. What about I mean, I've got neighbors that are 40 plus. Okay. Years. Do we care about that demographic? I know in some communities, it's, very, it's a very main thing, you know, like who's from away and what's their opinion and are they, you know, so. Well, with, with such a strong, I think it, it becomes a divide here about, you know, people who've been here a long time and the newbies. So I think it's worth getting that info. Okay. So 20 years isn't considered a long time? 20 oh, plus? I, I, yeah, I, I don't have a, an opinion on the number of years. We probably so maybe, don't need so many categories. Mm, yeah, so maybe yeah. less than five. Uh, Six five to 20. Five to 20. Mm -hmm. And then greater than, than 20. 20. Yeah, agreed. And then I think Noah is, is suggesting Hey, maybe you have a 30 plus or something like that. Just break that 20 up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Retired folks could easily be 40, 50 years here. Right. So less than five, six to 20, 21 to 30, and then 30 plus. So that's what you want. It's like four categories. Four. <laughs> Not that it really matters. Like if you've been here for more than 20 years, like you're probably, I mean, I think you, you know qualify as somebody who's a, a long not a short, timer. not a short timer. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Depends on who you ask. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Only in Maine. Yes. Okay. And these will all be when we make this uh, all live for you guys. Um, in which you will not share the links with anybody until it's fully like oh, we can reset everything so whatever you enter in we can like reset it when it becomes live so we can just delete like if you're um shooting for the 26 to get this all ready you can go to the website take a look at that click on the buttons to hit each of these review them fill them out yourself see how it feels give us feedback and then when it goes live which will make like july 11th probably um we'll just delete all your data so it, you can enter this in as many times as you want to try different things and don't worry, we won't count it. So then come back again once it's live and make sure we get your opinion. Sounds good. Do okay. we do we want to ask those? Do we want to have a small little paper paper survey for people to do at the public meeting, just to hand them when the they same. come in, so that we get that, so we capture that as much of that information as we can. Oh, the demographics. Yeah. We can put it on the back of their like comment card too. Maybe oh, that's oh, yeah. like a yeah. thing. So it's or all on one the thing. agenda or, you know, somewhere yeah. where we yeah, I mean, if they're, if they're and... handing us their definition of open space anyway, having right. on the back yeah. that demographic information would be great. Just cut down on things that they, pieces of yeah. paper they need to remember to turn in. Um, yeah. The other thing um, for at the, the workshop would maybe just be a map saying, like, put a dot where you live. Mm. Um, yeah. So that we're ca kind of capturing that yep. visually and we could do that for the um the community events also so we know who we're talking maybe who we're talking to at the community events and give it a little bit of an another interactive um piece right
Doug, go ahead. Oh, you're muted. You're still muted. Yeah, can you unmute? Bottom left hand of your screen, Doug. Is that better? Yes. yes. There you go. Yeah. Zoom Zoom calls are not my favorite thing, I have to say. <laughs> I we we spent a uh, We've spent half an hour, 40 minutes on the demographics, and I never heard, I have been here since the beginning, and I, but I, I never heard a good answer as to what we're doing with that data and why we're collecting it, um, especially since we're spending a lot of time um, doing a very detailed revision of exactly what data we are collecting in each of these categories. What, you know, what's our, what is our purpose uh, in this? Well, in terms of demographics, um, part of it is just to see how different cross sections might value or where they value, what types of open space they value or where they, um, what's important to them. I think it's still, and it's to help us understand who's responding. Um, are there biases in there that we need to be thinking about as we're analyzing and looking at the data? Good. So we'll do a summary and produce some results that incorporate the demographic data and that'll be available for people to see. I think that we can we can talk about it as a committee if the committee feels like that it's important to have that level of analysis, but I'll defer to to Bushed to weigh in on this too. Yeah, we'll provide a summary in the report um, on kind of what we learned and we can take a look and see if there are any, um, you know, who participated in it and kind of show it as, you know, we got, you know, we received this many people from these parts of town, breaking it down always to show like the people from the West said this and the people from the East said this, like, we don't necessarily always need to highlight that, but it will show the cross section of the engagement range. We know this number of people participated who have kids. Um, if if we're curious to dig into the data to understand how these different groups are um, contributing, we can do it. I don't think we typically do because it's more about a general consensus across the board. But uh, if we see that it's really weighted where most of the people who are filling this out are over 65, it may shift what we're doing for distribution like do has have we sent a list have we sent a, an email blast to you know the rec department or the schools or something like that to get like a younger demographic or it's more about using it to make sure we have a nice cross section not pitting the groups against each other no that's a good answer it it, it, it will be used in the report it'll be available to the public to see what the demographic data was used for so that's good Any other questions? Uh, we can, I have one more slide if we want to um, just take a look at quickly at the, if we're feeling good about the engagement. Um, I'll just share a quick outline of what we are at here. Okay, sorry. Sharing one screen, I'm looking at another screen. Um, so this is um, just a kind of entry level outline so that you can see where we're headed um, uh, with the report as a whole. So um, six sections, um, all in blue. Um, the introduction, we want to um, outline kind of a vision for the town in relation to um, open space and conservation. We want to provide a definition of open space. Uh, a little guide on how to use this plan, just to direct um, users uh, to the sections and, and how this plan might um, kind of be used to 
um, make change. And um, we wanted to draw reference to the 30 by 30 goal. I think that this plan should extend beyond um, you know, the next six years, um, but we can have a touch point on that um, and so some of the strategies uh, could be used or all of the strategies could be used to try to achieve that goal. So just sort of an acknowledgement of that. There may be other elements that we want to um, acknowledge as well, um, particularly at the, that point. I know the vote will have occurred around um, the investment into open space. So we could even you know, reference where the, the town is at uh, in relation to their conservation work. And then um, section two will be just be a summary of the process. So we'll explain the timeline and the steps taken and um, the, the approach to how we did the planning. Um, We'll, this is where we'll also have the public engagement summary. Um, the raw data, the actual um, responses, we can or provide in an appendix, but we can give kind of a big picture overview of um, how we engage with the public and generally what the public said, what were those high um, value areas that came out of the, the process. So we want to kind of build up um, to the, the strategies by um, kind of referring back to what the public was saying. Uh, and then section three, I um, have the state of Scarborough open space. And this is sort of a snap, meant to be a snapshot of where we are today. So where do we have existing open space? How is it broken down? What's public, what's private, what's um, state and federal? Um, and then an introduction um, into the um, existing resource, those resource categories. So what kind of habitat exists and where is it located and what's the highest value habitat and um, you know the significance of agriculture and forestry within the town of Scarborough and kind of a, a snapshot into each of these that will be grounded in data. So this is sort of like, what does the data say? Where are we starting off? Section four, conservation priorities maps. So um, the intent is for this to show high, medium, and low areas of prioritization. Um, we'll explain the data behind the map, um, you know, how we kind of arrived at this. I'm sure that will also be sort of in the approach and the method but we kind of want to give a section of the report to um, to this and also show that map in relation to the growth development areas um, from the comprehensive plan and the zoning I know that that was something we talked about last time you know how are we integrating the growth development areas into all of this we're not including it in the prioritization map itself. It's not one of those data points. It's an overlay so we can see where the high areas are within the, um, the growth areas and um, where they are in, um, in the, uh, the non-growth development areas. Section five, and this is kind of the, like the meat of where we're gonna be getting into uh, in our next two meetings in August and September are um, what are the strategies that we want to employ to expand conservation. So we know where our high and low priority areas are, um, but then on top of that, what can we do with those high, medium, and low areas? with ordinance revisions, funding sources, potential development fee structures, um, uh, emphasizing conservation easements on public land, uh, work with the Scarborough Land Trust, and we can kind of, this is, will we'll take shape um, and where a lot of the, um, really the recommendations are going to live in section five. And then section six, um, uh, it's kind of a summary wrap up where we have, um, in order to implement these strategies, here's the way that you would do this. So um, I like to think of this as kind of like the Cliff's Notes section. So if you want to skip everything else and all the details and how the plan was made, you can jump right to section six and see, like, here's what you guys need to do. Like, here's here are the, the action steps that we recommend taking, um, maybe short term and long term action steps to um, expand conservation land based on the priorities uh, or the, the strategies that we identified in section five. And then I have some appendices there. I think um, the public engagement data, we can choose whether we want to actually include that raw data as part of an appendix or just kind of keep it at the town for people to view who are interested. Um, I think having an appendix with all of the maps, so you have one place to go to to see the habitat maps and the recreation maps and the, the, the way that we developed that um, conservation prioritization map. And I know also as part of this, we're developing an ordinance revision memo. Um, and so we can make that as a separate appendix um, or it may be something that we just embed in section five. Um, but I thought it was helpful to kind of have you guys understand all this work we're doing now, how it might fit into that final product. Um, so happy to 
take any questions or feedback. This is an evolution. Jessica, Cressy put a question in the chat asking if agriculture and forestry will include fisheries, clamming, oyster farms and beds, for example, aquaculture in addition to traditional agriculture. I guess that's a good question for like, it's all based in the data, right? Um, any data for that? So we do have some um, aquaculture facilities, um, oysters specifically in, in Scarborough. I'm not sure um, if that lives in, um, in any of like the publicly available, but it's something I think that we might be able we, to in, include like in land, there. Land -based we can, facilities? Okay. Yeah, I think the issue is going to be finding the land-based facilities, right? Yeah. We can get all the lease areas, but those are in the ocean, and so not land point. that the town can conserve. Um, so I think if so, if there is uh, good detailed information about what land-based facilities are used for working waterfront, we could certainly put those in. The question would be is conservation is what you're talking about here part of working waterfront like is that it it would what would that what role would that play in thinking about where you want to conserve land um and and uh because i think it's kind of a it might be a different question i mean i could i could make the argument the other way too so <laughs> i think it's something to think about um but importantly we'd have to get the data I think there's a broader question, though, if you're looking at uh, fish and shellfish resources in terms of water quality right. and where you would protect the land to protect those resources, not necessarily um, immediately where they're harvested, uh, but what are the resources they need to be healthy and sustainable? And I, and I think all that will come out in the water quality section you know in that category where we've got where we're looking at the buffers from streams and you know how you protect water quality uh <clears throat> both groundwater and surface water quality and so i think that part of it is included in the water quality information that we have um so yeah and i mean the facilities are in in and adjacent to the scarborough marsh so recognizing the scarborough marsh watershed um, and focusing yep. on that, which will be a focus anyway, since it's the Scarborough Marsh. <laughs> yeah, I'm not definitely something speed. we can think about. Oh, I'm not know. necessarily up to speed, but are we counting the Scarborough Marsh uh, for our acreage, or are we not counting it? Or was that up for discussion still? Uh, it's there's been some discussion about it. It it it's basically in my mind is zero sum. So if we don't include it as conserved land, we remove that land from the, the town's tally altogether, the town's kind of land. acreage altogether. <laughs> so it's it's zero sum. So I um, we've had some discussions um, among town staff about this and staff feel like it, it should be included. Right, because if that's the case, then we could also consider counting the intertidal zone as or could we consider the intertidal zone as land, which would be sandbars, clam flats, everything that's perhaps underwater at high tide. That's a lot of acreage that is out of the water at low tide. So, so <laughs> go ahead, Judy. <laughs> You'll probably have a better answer for that than I will. <laughs> well, I think the ownership is the issue, right? Um, you know, so if the town, most of that land is is owned by the town, the inner tidal zone uh, that's outside, uh, what's not owned by private entities is owned by the town. And so you could say it's already conserved in that sense. Um, so I guess that, so the question is, and it's kind of the same question about working waterfront in this context, uh, is that is that space that you that the town wants that the town could or would want to purchase or conserve through some sort of easement um, from 
particular uses, right? I guess, so I think that's the key question in this open space, you know, idea, because in terms of thinking about open space as places we can build or not build, <laughs> right? Uh, we can't build in the intertidal for the most part, other than docks. Um, and so do you want, is there, a, is there some component of that in which the town could participate in protections um, and, and that people would want the town to do so? Because if the town were to conserve it, then would it be available for aquaculture or for wild harvest? Uh, you know, like, what would that mean? So I think it's a thing to think about. Yeah, I think putting it in the s simple terms of build or not build, um, if <laughs> I, I think that that makes the, the most sense and we're not gonna build in the intertidal. And that may come into play with our ordinance revisions just to make sure that they're, it's clear that those areas are protected through our zoning um, as, which I'm quite sure that they are, but um, but yeah, we're not built. We're not going to build in the intertidal. So I, I think that that's a, an area that is would not be counted or considered for additional protections or additional conservation. I should say. anything else? Yeah, any other questions or comments? I feel like we talked a lot about the engagement, which is so great to have your feedback and um, weigh in at this point. Um, I think we have pretty clear marching orders on what to do to prep for that. Um, and then these conversations um, about the existing conditions and how it relates to that 30 by 30 is certainly something we can pick up again in August. And at that point, we'll have some nice input from the, uh, we'll have like a month and a half of input from the town um, for the public engagement process. So we'll be able to share that as well. Um, do we wanna discuss a next meeting date? Cause I don't think that's on our calendar yet. So just while we have, um, have people on the line if we want to look for look at a date in August um, or I can throw one out I would say that I we, there may be um, I can't remember what their schedule if it's like the last meeting the last Tuesday or the third Tuesday but the more time we have after that public meeting to, the better like the the more prepared we'll be to show up with like a synthesis of kind of what we've learned if we make it early August we won't have had time to oh, yeah, no. do anything <laughs> Um, I, I was looking between the 20th and the 27th. Uh, let's do, the, uh, for at least for me, I'm um, the week of the 19th to the 23rd, I'm available, but then off the week before Labor Day. So the 20th might be the, the uh, date to shoot for. How does that work for, let me, let me just ask, do people, raise your hand if you have a conflict on the 20th. All right. So we'll go with the um, the twentieth at nine a.m. for the next um, the next meeting. If that, um, fantastic. And that one, Jessica, um, Zoom or hybrid? Can we plan to be hybrid, be in person? So if we're yeah. looking at data and things like that. Yeah, I think that's fine. So we'll, those that can join us in person, please do. We will have a Zoom option also. All right. So I'll just reiterate that um, Emerson will be reaching out to committee members about participating in the, um, the informal community event. So be looking for an email coming through from her and um, we um from the town side staff side will work on kind of logistics for location and things like that and i'll follow up um probably as soon as we kind of have our set location and things like that so that you all will know about um the location for the workshop 
Um, and I'll send out reminders as well with, um, with tasks and when to, um, when to show up on the, the 27th and um, what roles the, the committee members will have. Hey, Jamie. Yeah. I was asked a couple times and I just grabbed on the, hopped on the town website on the open space piece. Is there a way we could add a rough time frame of what this project's going to look like? Uh, yeah. You're probably already working on, I know I've been asked a couple times kind of where it fits with kind of benchmarks. So. Yeah, we can definitely add a timeline. So the, we do have um, a, a page on the town's website um, about the open space plan. Um, I think we're probably going to start navigating once the um, view sheds website for the survey and everything is up and running. Um, we'll probably reduce some of the information that's on the, the town's page and really um, direct people over to view shed for more of the information. Um, but we'll de we can add the timeline um, into the what's on the town's website currently, um, and we can work on incorporating that into view sheds potentially. Um, I'm okay having information in, in, in either or both place. I think people are going to go to the town's website looking for that information, and then we'll link from kind of our open space landing page over to the, the view shed website story map. We have a nice timeline for in the last slideshow that's just like a PDF. It's like one of the slides um, that can be like a graphic unless yeah. it has to integrate into like a calendar or something that the town. Yeah, it doesn't. I think um, we'll probably just we'll try to simplify a little bit um, mm. just because I mean, we'll we don't need specific. We'll we'll work on that on our end. Cool. Yeah, I'm not asking for specific just time frames like public engagement, July, you know, yep. you know, a uh, goal for report completion in December, just so people have a, you know, something to kind of, oh, I need to ask this or do this during that time frame. Yep. All right. Anything else before we wrap up? All right. Thank you all. Look forward to seeing you in July for all of our engagement activities. And uh, reach out with any questions in the meantime, or if you think of anything else, feel free to shoot me an email um, and we will go from there. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Bye-bye.